activities such as demarcation of the country. Now, the Ghana Maritime Authority, in collaboration with the Maritime Police and the Western Naval Command, has arrested eight persons suspected to be engaged in illegal oil bunkering along the coast of uh, the Western region. Investigations have also begun to establish where the suspects got the product from. Now, the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, DVLA, in the Ashanti region recorded a 30% increase in patronage of services in the first quarter of the year. Despite the negative impact of COVID-19 on businesses, the authority licensed 10,586 vehicles as against a figure of 8,100 within the same period for last year. All right, so those are the major stories we have for you by way of headlines here in Ghana. Let's find out what's happening elsewhere around the world, starting from Tanzania. Now, the United States Embassy in Tanzania has warned that there is a risk of exponential growth of COVID-19 cases in the country at a time when the government is not releasing data on new cases. In, uh, it's added that the hospital in the main city, Dar es Salaam, were overwhelmed and that the chances of contracting the virus was extremely high. The embassy did not, however, give any evidence to back its claim. Also around the world, Brazil has recorded its highest daily rise in the number of deaths from the coronavirus. It registered 881 new deaths on Tuesday, with a total death toll now uh, at 12,400. It means Brazil, which is at uh, the center of the Latin American outbreak, is now the sixth worst affected country in terms of recorded death. Lebanon has begun a total lockdown for four days following a rise in the number of coronavirus cases. The government had been easing restrictions imposed two months ago to try to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Lebanon has reported 870 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and 26 associated deaths. And a woman in the United States uh, city of Kentucky was shot and killed by police after they raided the wrong address. That's according to a lawsuit. Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old emergency medical technician who uh, was shot eight times when officers entered her apartment in Louisville on the 13th of March. And uh, here on the continent, the, one of the few countries that had not recorded any coronavirus case, that's Lesotho, recorded its first case today. And uh, to the shock of the country, it was imported by a Saudi Arabian who was going into the country for business. So technically, as it stands, almost every country on the continent of Africa has recorded a coronavirus case. Okay, so let's come to Ghana and focus on uh, some major cities and what they are doing regarding the news of corona outbreak, coronavirus spread cases. We're starting from the Ashanti region. There is currently an easy calm in Kumasi as COVID-19 cases in Oboise and other surrounding cities uh, rise. Residents fear the proximity of the mining district may accelerate the spread of the virus. Over 5,000 cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in Ghana. Oboise remains the hotspot in the Ashanti region with over 300 cases. The astronomical growth in cases is a worry to many residents in Kumasi. The closeness of the two districts perhaps justifies the concerns of people living in Kumasi. If we say, we interact with a whole lot of people on a daily basis. We are really scared of contracting the disease. Some residents of Oboase come to Kumasi to work. It's really scary without the nose marks. 
uh, we advise all to adhere to the safety protocols for some although the government has done well in case management more can be done to control the spread of the virus some health experts have called for an imposition of a lockdown on Obwase. Meanwhile, the wearing of nose masks is still a major challenge for some people. In the central business district, most people wear the mask while others walk about without any protection. All right, so that's uh, the story that came in earlier today, talking about how residents in uh, the Ashanti region are quite uncomfortable about development there. Let's go to Skype now and speak to my colleague, uh, William Evans Inkum, Ashanti regional correspondent, uh, to give us the latest regarding this problem. William Evans Inkum, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me, Martin. And uh, as you can see on your screen, uh, we also have um, Eric J, who is uh, our Western Regional Correspondent. who will be swinging to the Western Region also to find out what the situation there currently is. But let's start from the Ashanti Region. William uh, Evans Inkum, you have been reporting since the outbreak of the virus. We also do know that you have been following um, different reports after the lockdown was lifted, etc. Today, there is news that two people in Obwasi are responsible for well over 50 percent of the spread of the virus in Obwasi. What can you tell us about that? Well, it's quite an unfortunate situation. Then again, it raises or resonates the concerns as to why or the question as to why Obwasi wasn't under lockdown when the, the partial lockdown was first announced, especially Obwasi being the first administrative district to have recorded COVID-19 case in the Ashanti region. Well, uh, still there hasn't been any answers to that. Um, a lot of concerns are coming up, especially now that Obwasi is recording increasing number of COVID-19 cases. As you rightly mentioned, now Obwasi is counting some over 400 cases now. and the fact that people are anticipating what we call a lockdown, there's this kind of seeming or ostensibly um, exodus. People are moving uh, from the town to other areas, especially uh, Amancia Central, which is here to record a case. People are moving to that particular enclave. It's quite worrying. So, I mean, two people infecting, I mean, spreading the virus, I am not a luminary, but from 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 the experience that we've gathered from, I mean, by way of following um, the COVID-19 team and all of that, and some of the things that we've been saying, if care is not taken, we are likely to see a replica of what happened um, in the case of Obuasi. The two persons um, we're told are currently um, helping with investigations, at least they have been picked up or they, have been, they are with the um, medical team. They've been tested, confirmed that they are positive. Do we know any background? Do we have any background information on them? Or did they come from outside the country with the virus or they contracted it themselves in Ghana? Well, so information has been very scanty. What I, I have been told is that there is a husband and wife. Um, as to whether it was or they, they were victims of uh, a community spread, that one hasn't been established, except to say that they are still investigating um, this particular development, Martin. And uh, paint a picture for us about contact tracing. Um, we are told that some, some security, um, I beg your pardon, medical team have been deployed within that catchment area to expedite the tracing and then also testing. What, can you, what further detail do you have on that? Well, absolutely. So they are doing aggressive contact tracing, uh, partly voluntary, partly aggressive. Um, what we, I am getting as far as development from Obwasi is concerned is that uh, in certain areas, they will have to go the aggressive way. In other areas, they are doing what you call voluntary. Now, people are People want to know their status um, as far as the, the COVID-19 is concerned. I think that is encouraging. 
Um, in Kumasi here, I think it's a bit of relaxed uh, because of the stigma and all of that. Uh, but I don't know whether it's because of what is recording. I mean, growing number of cases, that is why people want to know uh, whether they have contracted it or not. And for that matter, they are willingly uh, making themselves available for them to be tested and all of that. But I think that's the only encouraging stuff as far as that particular enclave is concerned, Martin. All right, uh, let's go straight to the Western region now, if you can hold on for me, William. Um, Eric Yaoje, good evening and thank you for joining us this evening from the Western Regional Capital of Takrade. Um, we do know that uh, well, really? either this week or um, late last week, you gave us an information about one person, a nurse actually dying from the coronavirus. What is the latest regarding the numbers in the Western region? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Good evening to you and good evening to our cherished viewers. Rightly so. Um, if you come to the Western region, what the regional health directorate is doing is that they normally um, come out with release on our situation. So last Sunday, our numbers were 52. But yesterday, according to the release that they sent, we are now hovering around um, 61 positive cases. And out of the 61 positive cases, um, eight representing 13.1% of the confirmed cases are health workers. Um, also, we have nine new positive cases recording, recorded from four districts. Then we have eight new suspected cases that they are following up for contact tracing. But in total, we have a suspected case number of 699, and the total negative out of the 699 are 434. Uh, we have around four, 204 results that are pending. And as you did indicate, um, last Sunday, we lost one of the eight workers to the COVID-19. Now, out of the 61 cases that we have, according to the release from the Regional Health Directorate, um, we have 46 of them being males and 24 of them being females. Martin, but um, the interesting bit with our case is the, the increasing number of health workers that we are having, that we, we, are, we are told that uh, if you look at the, the, the chart that are contract, have contracted the COVID-19, um, two we know are from the Takwa Insoye Municipal Assembly we know um, three are here in Sekeni Takrade. We are learning that one is from the Takrade Government Hospital, then two are from the Efiem Kwanta Regional Hospital. Mm -hmm. we, we have been told by our sources at Efiem Kwanta Regional Hospital that one of the health workers who contracted the COVID-19 is currently on the run and they are searching for him, Martin. If, if you say, the person is currently on the run. What do you mean? Can, can you help us understand? Was the person tested and has the person been told his or her result? And then under what circumstances would you say the person is on the run? Uh, precisely so. Um, we, uh, we worked our contact. When we, when we had the information, we're trying to get hold of uh, official sources, but we couldn't get any. So we're still going by what our source told us and the source mentioned that um, when the results came and it was communicated to the guy you know they have to follow up with the contact tracing so mm -hmm. when they were going to him for the information about the, the contact that he may have come into contact with mm -hmm. um, he was not in the house when they went okay now um have can you tell us whether or not the western region has also started voluntary testing are people you know on their own volition going to the hospitals or the medical facilities to be tested? Um, Martin, it is very hard to say because um, if you look at what is happening here in the Western region, the authorities are not speaking to some of us. Mm. So what we normally, the, this information I'm giving you is from the, exclusively from the list that 
the release that they sent out yesterday. Right. Um, I remember since last week, I've been trying to get hold of the regional health director. I've not been successful. I've been trying to get hold of the two deputies. I've not been successful. So it is hard to tell whether these are the cases that we are getting are as a result of contact tracing, voluntary testing, or suspected cases that they got their result mm. from, Martin. And uh, I'll be going back to um, William shortly. My final question to you before we go to William is, tell, we know that the Western region was not part of the, um, the regions that were locked down, but with the steady rise of the numbers, how are people complying with the protocols, the health protocols we've all been advised to go by? Are they observing especially the social distancing? Are they wearing their masks? Uh, yes, yes, I, I can say that uh, people are putting on their nose masks, people are having with them their hand sanitizers on their bags, on their wallets, and they, they are visible on them. The hand sanitizers are really visible on them. If you go to the various railway stations, you have Veronica buckets around. If you go to the banks before you are allowed entry, they make sure that you wear your masks and you have a hand sanitizer on you before you are allowed entry. I mean, mm. even if you come to our premises, it is a mandatory. You must. It is mandatory. You must be donning the face masks before mm. you are allowed entry. And I know a lot of media houses here are also following the same pattern. Many companies around have also instituted protocols to ensure that before you enter, you are taking through strict measures to ensure that you don't carry any mm. um, any vi the virus into their premises. All right. Um, William, back to you now. You talked to us about um, the fact that we have some medical team out there aggressively chasing and testing the persons who are likely to, to have come in contact with uh, the two positive cases. How about the the day-to-day -day activities of persons in some of these markets where these two persons operate? Are they now with the, know, with the knowledge of knowing that two persons are responsible for majority of the cases that were spread in Obwasi and surrounding townships, are they observing these protocols and are they doing so strictly? Absolutely. So um, the markets um, were closed to business. They are start, They are commencing um, trading tomorrow, and they are not. They, they are going to run a shift system. So they've categorized them into three. We have the blue, the green, and the yellow. So the blue team um, are starting business tomorrow, followed by the yellow that will be on the fifteenth. Then the um, the green on the 16th. Uh, one would say it is better late than never because this particular system was introduced in the Ashanti region by the Kumasi Metropolitan uh, Medical Team or COVID-19 team. Um, when they realized that cases were increasing, mm. it dawned on them to institute some measures that were least, um, one would say, um, complicate the movement of COVID-19. As we all know, it is human beings that, I mean, journey them and not um, the virus itself. So they needed a plan just to make it very impossible for cases to continue to grow. And it worked, even though there were some level of recalcitrance. I mean, some of the market centers at the point in time had to be closed down because they were not observing the social distancing protocol, despite the fact that they were they had the rotational system. Now the Obwase has that particular system and beginning tomorrow we are going to see that work out. For those who do not have the, or who were not part of the plan or have to um, ply their trade at Kunka, I think this particular system will see some level of decongestion mm -hmm. um, or, or create uh, enough space when it comes to the two meters interval that um, it has to be observed in order to um, control the spread of the virus and all of that. I think they'll be able to achieve that. Um, then again, um, they are also uh, enforcing, I mean, strict adherence to other protocols. I mean, the wearing of nose masks and all of that. Uh, so now from tomorrow, I think we are going to see a change in the narrative right. as far as fight against COVID-19 in the Obwase district is concerned, Martin. 
Right. And my last question to you, uh, William, will be the fact that we know there were protests against a facility that they wanted to use as a holding facility or an isolation center. Have they reasoned, the, have they been able to reason themselves up now to allow that facility to be used? It was always going to be difficult for the uh, protesters to have won um, as far as that particular development is concerned, because even the um, the, the owner of the thing has reasoned with the medical team to willingly hand it over just to help. Now, I can tell you that, yes, they are using it. Uh, the people or cases are being moved there. The good, news, the good news is that they've also been able to secure other places. But this time around, they've changed their modus operandi. I think what really nearly got them hit uh, the or oh, I mean, kind of a uh, hit the nut has to do with the fact that they readily gave out that particular information and now they've learned their lesson. So, even places where they've been able to secure nobody, even the people there, mm. don't know that they are using a particular facility for that cause. And I think that is helping out, Martin. Thank you so much, William Evans Inkum, our Ashanti regional correspondent. Just before we bounce off, uh, let's uh, come back to you in the Western region again, uh, Eric J. What is the challenge uh, that um, medical officers are facing when it comes to issues of um, isolation centers and places where uh, persons with a positive case could be kept for treatment? Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Um, I remember last Monday when I had an interview with the Municipal Chief Executive for Takpa in Shaim. He mentioned that they are facing a challenge getting places to send persons who have tested positive for COVID-19. He mentioned that before this issue became really a thorn in the flesh of many Ghanaians, um, hoteliers, um, some pastors, and other private individuals had promised him that when they have cases, they will send them there. But when they recorded their set case and they, they started going back to these people, they, they turned them down because they were saying that um, they will be, their hotels will be tagged, people will victimize their place, they will stigmatize their place and all that. So they are having a challenge trying to get places for persons who have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, he mentioned that they have the Takwa Municipal Hospital than the Apinto Government Hospital. But the place is not too big in big. I mean, I, he, the two places together can host about seven cases. So if you look at currently their case count is 19. So it means that if the, the two places are full, they have to restore to home management. And the home management, too, I'm told that some of the facilities are having a difficult trying to get try to get the, uh, the landlords to understand the situation at hand. Right. We are learning that um, some, land, some landlords are threatening to um, eject some of the patients who are undergoing home management mm. at, their, at their place. And again, to what I say is that if there's going to be any revolt here in the Western region, maybe it will start with health workers. Right. Because, for instance, I, I Martin, Yes, um, yes, I, I know you are summing it up for me, but uh, for the purposes of time, we'd have to leave it here for now. But thank you so much, um, Eric Yawajay, Western Regional Correspondent, for the amazing job you're doing. Thank you so much. And in the Ashanti region too, we have um, William Evans Inkum, who has been uh, a force to reckon with when it comes to reporting in that region. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Let's continue uh, updating our viewers. And in here, I'm Martin Isiridati. This is News at 10. On Wednesdays, it is The Stands where we uh, give our colleagues the opportunity to tell us what's been happening behind the scenes in covering stories for you. Stay with us. We have some more stories coming shortly. Thank you for staying with TV3. This is News at 10. And uh, we're going straight to our second story we're looking at for you this evening. The Ghana Maritime Authority, in collaboration with Maritime Police and Western Naval Command, has arrested eight persons suspected to be engaged in illegal oil bunkering along the coast of the western region. Investigations have also begun to establish where the suspects got the product from. The Ghana Maritime Authority, together with the Maritime Police and the Western Police um, Naval Command, have since March this year 
been patrolling the coast of western and central regions to clamp down on illegal activities, including oil bunkering. And that's the information that we uh, have got this evening. And I want to go to go straight to the lines and speak to our correspondent. Uh, before we do that, though, on Monday, May uh, the 11th, the Ghana Maritime Authority headed to court to seek an uh, order to destroy seized wooden boats used for illegal uh, fuel trade along the coast of Central and um, other Western region. Director General of the Authority, Thomas Kofi Alonsi, spoke exclusively to my colleague, Josephine Nchi Ejei. Illegal bunkering is done at night at the blind side of authorities. The illegality had assumed alarming proportions with more people in the trade. Locally called Adende, illegal boats are built without certification to use or to go to sea with. And disguised as fishing boats, these massive wooden vessels have the storage capacity of 10,000 of liters. Thongs of fuel is pumped from the tankers into the local boats which sail to different beaches and discharge their content into awaiting road fuel tankers. Large quantities of fuel, mostly diesel, spills on the beaches, which also cause pollution to the water. The illegally procured fuel, which is usually of low quality, ends up on the market, having escaped the regulatory scrutiny and quality assurance from the National Petroleum Authority, NPA, imposing a serious risk to vessels. The Director General of the Ghana Maritime Authority, Thomas Alonzi, says the boat owners have violated the authority's law, which requires them to obtain permits. For any ship to engage in ship-to-ship -ship transfer of oil, you need an approval from the Ghana Maritime Authority. The guys involved in this illicit business are becoming so courageous and brave that they don't even see the activity as illegal. We've been joined on Skype by my colleague, uh, Josephine Nchi Uh She's been monitoring this particular story for us. Uh, good evening, Josephine. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, Martin. Um, we know that you've been, you've been quite keen in chasing this story and you've had an interaction with the Director General. What has he told you about their intent to go to court and what's the latest regarding that? Right, Martin. Uh, as we played the story, we actually explained what is actually going on currently. That they have been battling with this issue for so many years. But uh, beginning of this year, I, I think they advanced the operations and dipping uh, more operations into how they can really nip this operation in the back. But what he told me was that the illegal department of the Ghana Maritime Authority have taken steps. Actually, they are fully prepared to go to court so that they can get an order which will allow them to destroy the confiscated boats that they have seized. Currently, when you go to the second day naval base, you find so many of them, more, more than 500 of them that they have seized and it's creating a nuisance there and for them they believe that if they are able to put these boats there they get the order for them to destroy the boats bend all of them it will serve as a big deterrent to those who indulge in this trade they wouldn't feel like going back to mm. construct a, a huge mighty boat like this and then spend so much money mm. and, and 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 then do it so they believe that well, they are advancing that cause for that law, and they are hoping that uh, getting to the end of the year, they should be making bigger progress so that they can get to clear off all these boats that they have confiscated mm. at, the, at the Naval Command. And, and today, for instance, operation was really an interesting one. And also, uh, uh, we applaud the team for undertaking this one because today they were able to get eight people Many a times they get to get the boats and right. then, then you find the offenders who have bolted. So today was, was, was a big one. The, the guys which have been picked up are with the Marine police. Mm. And then uh, I'm told that they are also preparing their documents so that they can process them mm. also for court, Martin.
Right. How much revenue has the authority lost? Well, it, it, when I spoke to him, uh, what he told me was that the revenue bit of it that he's much concerned about is the revenue they have to pay to the state. That is the Ghana Revenue Authority. Mm. Per the process, uh, when any vessel, any supply oil vessel docks at our port, especially the Western and Central ports, that's where they normally come. The process is that when any vessel comes, you have to come straight to the anchorage. Mm -hmm. When you come, we test the quality of the fuel. That is NPA, uh, NPA National Petroleum Authority, to mm -hmm. check the quality. And then that's where customs comes in. Then they can also levy you the duty that you're expected to pay. But in this case, where, where they find themselves at high seas, they hide there, and then they, they, they siphon, they offload this one to a small boat, and then uh, they, they bring it ashore. Mm. Could you believe that? No, I was just about to hear what I didn't believe, and unfortunately, the, the line seemed to have dropped. But we'll try and reconnect with um, uh, um, Josephine, my colleague, on the issue regarding um, how some eight persons have been arrested for illegal oil bunkering. Uh, when we do establish contact with her, we'll um, wrap up the conversation with her regarding what the next line of action would be for the authority. She has given us a background as to how long these persons have been had undertaken this illegality. Also, we know that the authority uh, had been chasing them, but fortunately, um, they have been able to arrest not just the vessels, but the individuals who've been perpetrating this illegality. They are being processed for court in the coming days. We are hoping to hear something regarding that. Joseph was just telling us about uh, revenue lost to the state as a result of the illegal um, activities of these oil bunkers. And when we do uh, establish contact with her, would uh, help her uh, finish up that conversation with us. This is the stands on TV3 News at 10. Stay with us. We have some more stories coming up shortly. Thank you for staying with TV3. And you know that we are very national in nature and global as well. So we've touched base with major uh, key places in the country. Let's go overseas to the United States of America now. As of Tuesday night, there have been more than 343,705 cases of the coronavirus in New York. And if you go specifically to New York City, they have about 191,000 uh, positive cases of the coronavirus. Now, more than 27,000, almost 28,000 people uh, with COVID-19 have died in New York, including people with probably, but not uh, um, less to that, people who may have died not necessarily out of the virus. Nationwide, over 1,375,000 cases of the coronavirus have been confirmed across uh, 50 states in the U.S. Let's go straight there and speak to um, someone who's been monitoring activities there. He's Ghanaian and has been living there for some time. He's also a, a journalist as well. Benjamin Tete, good evening and thank you for joining us via Skype. Hi, good evening. My pleasure. Right. To start with, um, how are you coping and how is the, the, the situation as we speak in New York? Hmm. I think we're coping after, what, a month, you more like get used to it. Now, um, you rather plan your life according to um, the daily routines and see what you do to stay active whilst also living your life. So, yes, obviously, staying home is a challenge. Um, that has been the, the case, but overall across New York, comportments have been great. Mm. It's rather lately, um, as this, the weather gets better, um, like as of today, the sun has been out. It's uh, nearly 7 p.m. here, but the sun is still out. Sometimes it will be out to late, almost 8 p.m. So yeah, mm. periodically you see people going out into the parks which has been a concern to the government, uh, mm. to the governor and to the authorities in New York. But, I mean, next to me is this park. Each day the police are patrolling the parks and they are ensuring that people don't get crowded. So mm. if they see more than 10 people gather, they will stop by and, and close you. But the challenge as well, again, which is one of the big issues with the U.S. is how disproportionate the patronage is. Mm. So in places like um, where you see... We have seen videos of pictures of 
the white dominant areas where you see a lot of whites in the park and not many pe police people go to disperse them. Mm. As against, let's say, places like um, Queens, the Bronx, um, where you see Latinos, you see African Americans, and they're over there, rather, the, the intensity of the patronage is. So, yeah, that is also one challenge that has so far surfaced. Right, and, and that actually dovetails into my next question, having to do with the black community. We, um, Donald Trump, a few weeks ago, said that majority of the persons dying were from the black and Hispanic communities. How is the black community in the U.S. generally taking the fact that they seem to be the hardest hit race in the U.S.? Mm. So far, you can monitor from the statements coming from um, the associations, um, the groups that are um, more like the officials and also the popular figures when it comes to the black communities. A lot of them have been very vocal on that subject. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we've, we've spoken about the fact that the underlying factors are clear. You know, everyone is staying home, but a lot of the, the African-Americans, the Latinos, the minority communities are the people at the front line. Mm -hmm. They are going out. They are the delivery people. They are sending food to people's doorsteps. They are in the homes of aged white folks and other um, aged people mm. taking care of them. They are work running the nursing homes. They are nurses. They are health workers. So a lot of Af African-Americans people are indeed exposed, same as a lot of the Ghanaians here or other Africans here who are mostly working in the health sector, either as one health aide or a home care worker or um, any of those services. So these right. are people who have become vulnerable. And so daily, though there is a lockdown, daily they are those using the trains. They are those using the buses. And these are the means through which people pack. It's right. and obviously exposing themselves. The virus. Right. Now, then based on that concern, let's look at um, what the alternative could be. Our cases in Ghana are rising. Unfortunately, we are past 5,000. But at least we are far, far better than what's happening in the U.S. And we do know that some Ghanaians would want to come home. And in line with that, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has released a statement uh, outlining modalities people need to go through uh, if they want to come to Ghana. Has that information been made public in the U.S.? And has the Ghanaian reaction to it? Yes, I first heard of the news from the, the um, Ghana mission here in New York. Um, that as that was last week, uh, they had been reaching out to some Ghanaians and informing them um, to let them know that this is the opportunity. So yes, uh, the word has been spreading. So far, it looks like um, the 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 procedure is well. Now that at least the Foreign Affairs Ministry is coming out with clearer measures to the public, we'll get to know more. Initially, they were mentioning people who would want to go home. And even that, um, you would register and then it would be sent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Accra. Mm. And then they will now confirm, I guess, nationalities and all before a date will be announced for um, evacuation. So there is still a bit of uncertainty as to when that will happen. Mm. Um, mm. I spoke to some Ghanaians. Um, yes, as travel has become a challenge, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of them are still working. So, yes, the, the, the thought of going home as of now and what they will be doing obviously will be a factor. So as to how many people will go, I guess will go down a lot to those who have maybe some pressing needs at home to go and do. Mm. Um, yeah, I think in the coming days we'll get to know. But as of last week, I spoke to a top official at the Ghana mission. Mm. He confirmed to me, he told me people are calling in and they've been busy receiving a lot of um phone calls from Ghanaians who are living here. And uh, we also, your earlier submission, you touched on the fact that because you have a lot more black people in front line working, so they come direct in contact with the virus. Naturally, that is why the numbers of black people dying is going high. Do we have Ghanaians who have died that you know of or that you've heard of? And how did people react to their death? Um... Yes, I think um, about, let's say about a month ago, that's in April, I said April when at the peak when New York 
had recorded some of the highest cases and New York suddenly overtook um, the world as the epicenter. We had cases of, especially here in New York, mm -hmm. um, I could count close to 10 people. Um, out of that, I knew about two of them. The rest, I got confirmations because from families and relatives who lost um, their dear ones. Well, that's also awakened us, awakened our people. So uh, just today, today I spoke to someone who went to work. Um, he is a home care worker, not a Ghanaian, but from a neighboring country. And he went there and um, the person he's taking care of, obviously an aged person, mm. was venturing to go out and eat in a restaurant. Mm. This Ghanaian told the client, I'm afraid if you continue going out, I will walk out from this work and I won't come back. Obviously going to the restaurants, first of all, the restaurants we're not supposed to be serving food mm. it's in there people mostly do delivery that's the instructions from the city authorities that people going to gather in the restaurants would obviously pose a problem so restaurants are considered to be essential service so people have to especially if you live in new york not many people here can cook mm. a lot of people live on breakfast lunch and supper in restaurants right. and so yes they've kept them open but people somehow are still taking advantage and going out in, in the name of um, getting food. Right. So yes, yeah, some of our people are now taking measures. I know of health workers at nurse who are saying she will not wear, she will not go to help if she doesn't get the full um, PPEs, for example, mm. and they are supposed to even get replacement. So let's say two, so that if you work and you go to break and you come back, you may not necessarily have to wear the same one. Right. They are insisting on this. And I think um, following the news about how the, the COVID-19 was impacting our populations, mm. a lot of them have taken caution. And I think that has improved, uh, especially within the, Niger uh, the Ghanaian, the African community in general here for now. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Benjamin Tete, a Ghanaian journalist there in the U. Is that a Senegalese flag in your room? <laughs> That's a Senegalese flag. <laughs> oh, wow. You are one of the few who, who could make the difference. Uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, I do not have, I have a Ghanaian jersey, but I do not have a Ghanaian flag. <laughs> also because I was I was based in Dakar, for example. So, right, right, um, right. and since you saw that, the Baobab tree out there is like the big <laughs> symbol of Senegal. So yeah. yeah, those were like souvenirs I brought from Senegal. <laughs> All right, great. It's beautiful. It's still African. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tete, uh, for making time to speak with us. He's a Ghanaian living in the U.S. He's also a journalist, giving us an update of development in the United States of America, specifically New York, regarding how people are coping uh, with the uh, coronavirus. So we'll uh, keep base with um, other um, correspondents dotted across the world to see how they are also managing the situation. But for now, though, that is how we bring the bulletin to a close. I am Martin Esiedudati. Always a pleasure sharing your company. Do have a good evening. And as always, stay positive and take good care of yourself. Bye for now. Only 1.5 million liters of water. We are so certain to record the high number of people arrested during the lockdown. Some of them have started saying, may you that they sample our meat. But was it as simple as that?